Hello, and welcome to this edition of COVID Ethics Update, a service of the Center for Practical Bioethics during the COVID-19 pandemic. Thanks for joining us. My name is Terry Roselle. I serve as the Rosemary Flanagan Chair at the Center. Our topic today is the intersections of bioethics, healthcare law, and public health in a pandemic situation. And my guest is Dr. Kayan Parsi, who is a professor of bioethics and the graduate program director at the Neiswanger Institute uh, for Bioethics at Loyola University in Chicago. It's also with the Chicago Stritch School of Medicine. And thank you, Ken, for being with us today. Thank you for inviting me. I want to start with just noting that you are in the Chicago metro region, which has been one of the coronavirus hotspots in recent weeks. Um, how's it going as of today, which is April 20th? Uh, and what are you learning in the midst of this sort of pandemic situation up there in Chicago? I, I think the state has been very proactive. I think our leadership, both at the state level, Governor Pritzker, uh, the mayor, Mayor Lightfoot in Chicago, have been both very proactive in trying to address this and uh, listening to public health experts, um, imposing stay-at-home orders early on. And so I think at, at that level, I think our leadership has been very um, assertive in dealing with um, the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, I will say that with regards to the community of ethicists here in Chicago region, I've been very impressed with the level of energy and organization displayed. So. Um, there's been a um, kind of an informal organization organized by Dr. Kelly Michelson mm. at Northwestern, who directs the Center for Bioethics and Medical Humanities there. Um, we started meeting maybe a little over a month ago um, via Zoom sessions. Um, they created a listserv, and so now I think there's well over 60 um, ethicists who are part of this um, coalition if you will, that didn't exist a month and a half ago. Oh, and so- well, Metro area. Yeah, and then Chicago metro area, a few folks outside of the immediate you know, Chicagoland region, but uh, almost everyone from the Chicago region, from all the major health systems, academic medical centers, hospitals. So it, I've just been very impressed with how our community of bioethicists have come together to uh, share policies, to, exchange resources, to brainstorm, to address a variety of issues um, with regards to this pandemic. And so we, we meet regularly um, once a week. And, uh, and I, I think I've, I've just been, like I said, just very impressed with um, how we've been trying to address this. And, and it's been, I think, a great benefit to, to all of us. That is impressive. Is, has it uh, mostly been around uh, crisis standards of care triage guidelines or other other things that you're talking about uh, in regard to the pandemic? I would say that um, for the most part, it's been a, a, about the triage policies and mm -hmm. ventilator allocation, those kinds of immediate acute care concerns that I think everyone's been trying to grapple with mm -hmm. uh, wherever they are. Um, so I would say that uh, that's been a lot of what we've been trying to address and share resources um, and share policy. So that's been a big part of our conversations. But certainly there's been other um, things that we've been interested um, with with regards to uh, issues related to racial disparities, with regards to how disparate the impact has been with regards to um, the pandemic and various communities here in Chicago. Um, how to engage um, the public with this um, with this new pandemic and how to educate people about this um, uh, this new set of challenges I think that's been part of what we've been talking about so um, so there's been a variety of issues but certainly I would I would agree with you that a lot of our energy has been devoted to um, the issue of triage policies and ventilator allocation talk a bit more about how you're experiencing the Chicago area uh, the disparity of infection rates, illness, and, um, and, and death rates also primarily experienced 
by the African American community or uh, Lat uh, Latinx community. Um, here too, and I was talking with a African American uh, colleague, community leader, just recently about how that's that's been the case here in Kansas City. Um, African Americans, uh, especially, um, having a much greater mortality than their numbers in the population. Otherwise, is that what you're talking about in Chicago? Yeah, absolutely, and and they, I think that's reflected here as well. Uh, where we're seeing this pandemic is affecting people of color at a mm -hmm. much more disproportionate level um, than their numbers would reflect. So if you're looking at, say, for the African-American community, which is 30% of the Chicago population, it's disproportionately affecting that community uh, twice as much with regards to infection. And so that's been a source of a great deal of concern with regards to um, how the pandemic, and I think this is nothing new to us, but I think for for a lot of people, this is just kind of, it, it's um, made evident what we all know in fields like bioethics and public health, that um, there is a great deal of structural racism in this country. And, uh, you know, we all have heard how your zip code determines a great deal of your health status. Very much the case here in Chicago, there was a study that uh, occurred a year or two ago that looked at um, health status among people that lived in Streeterville, which is an affluent community in, in downtown Chicago, versus Bronzeville, which is on the south side. And um, and the you're looking at 15 years uh, disparity with regards to issues related to lifespan. Um, all of those disparities just get exacerbated and, um, and just made clear when we're dealing with a pandemic like this. So, um, so I don't think Chicago is unique. I think every city in this country is probably seeing that kind of um, disproportionate impact on communities of color. But I think it's particularly pernicious here in Chicago where we're, we're seeing this play out um, in our community, especially in the south and west sides of Chicago. You had wanted to talk some about the intersections of public health and bioethics literacy. What do you mean by that? What I mean is that I think for a lot of people, um, people that are lay people that are not trained in bioethics or public health, a lot of this is very new. And so when uh, a lot of this information was being conveyed, things like social distancing and covering your face and the importance of uh, face masks, um, testing, surveillance, all of these things were really not well known to, I think, a large swath of the public. Um, you know, people are not trained in public health. People are not typically trained in bioethics. These are kind of esoteric fields for a lot of people. Um, even our own medical students don't get courses in epidemiology. So so to me, that there, I think what this has uncovered is that um, a lot of people don't have kind of the, the basic uh, literacy skills with regards to public health. And, and I think part of that is just because many of us have never lived through um, a pandemic or even an epidemic like of, of this um, size and scale and scope in our lifetimes. Um, so this is all new. And same thing with, um, with bioethics. So, you know, I think a lot of lay people hear about it in the media. Oftentimes there is dealing with kind of esoteric topics that are you know, maybe artificial intelligence or cloning, um, things like that. But with regards to something, a crisis of this magnitude, I think fields like public health and bioethics can do a much better job of trying to better transmit and translate all this information to uh, a broader public and how to increase people's level of understanding. Um, I can give you one example, which I think is a very useful example, is just uh, th this kind of notion of social distancing, which um, I think people just started hearing about just in the last couple months. I mean, really, people didn't hear about this last a year ago. No one would have heard of social distancing. Um, that term itself, I think, created some level of confusion because people don't understand, well, Initially, it was three feet, and then it became six feet, and then some people were talking about it should be more than that if you're in certain settings. And so 
uh, if you hear people that are experts in public health communication, they'll say that, you know, we should be very precise in our language. We should talk about physical distancing, not social distancing, right. because we can still engage with people socially via uh, electronic means. I mean, we're engaged right now with this uh, Zoom session, you know, so we're, we're not uh, socially distant, but we are physically distant. And I think that's um, a really important point is that um, officials, experts need to be very precise in the way they convey information to the public because I think people are just inundated with so much information. And so to me, that's an ethical obligation actually of, um, of experts, of public health officials, of our leaders, government officials is to be as clear and as precise and to be as non-jargon laden as possible. You know, we're, we're, we're not trying to make people public health experts, but we want to make them understand what, uh, what's going on and what are their obligations, you know? And so, so to me, uh, this is a, an ethical obligation of a variety of stakeholders, mm -hmm. uh, but, but particularly people that have certain levels of authority, such as experts and officials. So bioethics literacy, uh, the, the imperative falls on us who are literate uh, right, to, I, uh, that's to right. communicating, I, commu communicating uh, in better ways. I, that's right. I, I think, um, you know, we, as ethicists, I think, you know, we, um, we sometimes will um, pick up the kind of clinical jargon, especially if we do clinical ethics as part of our jobs. And, um, and I think part of that is because we, you know, we're acculturated to that, to that setting and to that and to that world of clinical care, um, but I think again it's imperative upon us for those of us who are bioethicists, whether we're clinical ethicists or public health ethicists or academic ethicists, is when we're dealing with these kinds of issues and when we're engaging the public to be uh, very clear and very transparent. Um, and um, and I think that's uh, that's a really important shared obligation. And you are a moral philosopher and ethicist, but you're also, uh, you have a law degree. Uh, what legal issues do you see as, as being particularly weighty and interesting in this pandemic crisis? Well, there's a, a number of important legal issues. Um, for one thing, there I think there's issues that healthcare professionals worry about, which is liability, of course. Um, there's certainly a lot of concern among healthcare professionals about their liability and exposure to liability, especially during this pandemic. And what we're seeing is some states have um, have issued executive orders that limit liability. So, for instance, here in the state of Illinois, Governor Pritzker um, issued an executive order that mm -hmm. limits uh, liability and that grants civil immunity to healthcare practitioners during this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Now it's, it's limited to civil liability, not criminal liability. Um, and, and so absent uh, gross neglect, uh, gross malpractice, um, practitioners should be, uh, at least hopefully can rest easy that they won't be exposed to um, you know, civil liability while they're going about taking care of their patients during this pandemic. So that has been, I think, one way for um, the states and, you know, for instance, the state, uh, state of Illinois that, that I live in, where they've tried to address this issue of liability. Another uh, issue that's arisen in the courts and, and here in Kansas, where I am uh, reside as well, is uh, lawsuits filed by disabilities activists uh, who are claiming that the triage guidelines are fundamentally discriminatory against those with disabilities. Do you think that has merit? This is an issue that occupied a, a great deal of time on our listservs. As you know, you've probably seen these um, extensive discussions about uh, the issue of disability and what rights do people have with disabilities with regards to um, these policies. And I think my, my takeaway is that we want to avoid any semblance of discrimination based on these criteria, whether it's race, gender, um, national origin, ethnicity, and disability, of course. 
uh, age is another category which this has come up and so I think that uh, when we're crafting these policies we have to be very careful that when we're crafting policies we're, we're trying to focus on for instance survival to discharge physiological uh, conditions as opposed to things such as a person's age uh, we never want to use age as a kind of proxy for someone's health status so um, so I think the the appropriate way to, to look at these kind of situations to say will this patient if they're given uh, and whatever intervention say a ventilator but it could be something else but say a ventilator uh, will this person survive to discharge as opposed to looking at other kinds of criteria such as um, age or disability uh, which really shouldn't have any kind of moral relevance thank you so much Ken this has been very interesting um, we're going to stop at that but we could continue on for a long a long time uh, I've enjoyed this. I uh, thank you so much for for joining us on the COVID ethics update. I need to say that the views and perspectives that we hear from our guests are not necessarily uh, reflecting the positions of the Center for Practical Bioethics. And those who are listening, uh, I thank you for joining us. If you have any questions, ideas, suggestions for future editions of the COVID ethics update, please email us at covid at practicalbioethics.org. That's covid at practicalbioethics.org. Thanks again for joining us. Be safe, stay well. Bye-bye.